Hey there, good afternoon and welcome to Coping with COVID. Updates on the pandemic and information to help you thrive and survive COVID-19. I'm Trey Taylor and uh, City Councilwoman Tamika Isaac Devine made a boss move when she lobbied Congress for money for rental assistance for folks that are affected by COVID because they can't pay their rent. We'll talk more to uh, Tamika in just a minute, but first here are some COVID with community updates. Don't forget tomorrow and Saturday, this week and next week on Friday and Saturday, there's free testing at the South Carolina State Fairgrounds. Of course, that's in Columbia, South Carolina. It is free from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. Bus, you must have an appointment. Go to KrogerHealth.com backslash COVID-19 testing. KrogerHealth.com backslash COVID-19 testing to make your appointment for a free COVID screening this weekend and next weekend, Friday and Saturday at the South Carolina State Fairgrounds. Yesterday, we talked about the new round of stimulus checks, which are not actually checks, they're debit cards that are being distributed this week. And now the IRS has given out a phone number that you can call if you have some information. As a matter of fact, the number uh, also came in a letter which told you when you were going to get your check. Tamika, I got the letter yesterday, but I got my check three weeks ago. So <laughs> imagine that. But the phone number is 1-800-919-9835, 1-800-919-9835. If you have a question about your stimulus check, maybe you don't think you got the right amount or you want to know where it is, you can call 1-800-919-9835. Of course, we're going to talk to uh, Tamika Isaac Devine in just a short, short about her emergency rental assistance program. And lo and behold, yesterday, SC Thrive and South Carolina House have collaborated to offer City of Columbia or South Carolina residents $1,500. Now that one-time payment will go straight to your landlord and it is a grant. It's a forgivable grant. They're not going to ask for the money back. You do have to qualify and you must be a South Carolina resident. All you have to do is apply. You can go to SC Thrive backslash COVID-19 rental assistance program. That's SC Thrive backslash COVID-19 rental assistance program and apply for the $1,500 grant, no payback, a $1,500 grant. That's a one-time grant that would go towards paying your rent. And um, this uh, money goes straight to your landlord. Hopefully you can get that. And by the time you get that, if you need more money, Tamika's resolution will be passed. Tamika Isaac Devine, thank you so much for joining us today on Coping with COVID. Oh, thank you, Trey. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So that's a boss move, girl, to say, listen, Congress, my folks need some money. <laughs> and and I want it. Tell me how that came about. I mean, I know you know that people do need the rental assistance. So uh, tell me tell me what happened with that process. So, you know, that was actually one of the first things I thought about when this pandemic started happening. Um, I remember actually uh, being on a show like the before things started shut down. And I said, you know, this is going to be horrible for folks. Um, and we're going to need to make sure that we are in a position to address people's financial needs. And so I've been talking and, and working through channels over the last eight, nine weeks, really to try and at least elevate that discussion. Um, you know, we, there was the moratorium on evictions and certainly right. that was a help. But what I explained to everybody is all the moratorium on evictions does is it puts people in position. So when the eviction um, stay is lifted, which was what, last week. Last week. <laughs> um, people are two and three months behind. And yeah. so, you know, it just, it, it doesn't, it didn't help. And then you've got people who are landlords who they're not, they're not like big businesses, big companies, that kind of stuff that can really float, not getting rent. For right. They need their money too. Yeah. yeah. They might have a mortgage on the property. They definitely got to pay their taxes. And so, the, the eviction moratorium really was not addressing the root cause of the issue. And so over the last couple of weeks, I, I've, I've talked to um, South Carolina Legal Justice, Sue Berkowitz. I talked to Benita Shopshire at SC Health. I mean, well, mm -hmm. um, State SC Housing. Drive, yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's, it's South Carolina State Housing because they had, you know, back in, remember, 2008, 2009, they had what they called. I remember. I remember. And so I talked to Benita about how do we, you know, reinvent SC Help and, and help with with that. Um, of course, talked to my colleagues as we were working on the small businesses and how we could do that. And then 
Um, I'm on the leader on the board of the National League of Cities. Um, and so on our board meetings, which we have board meetings now once a week, we mm-hmm. used to have them like once a month, but we meet once a week, just to kind of figure out what's happening around the country, okay. what are what you know, what others are doing. And we all had the same concern. And so as Congress continues to talk about different stimulus packages and what the needs are of the community and where this money should go, um, we felt like there really needed to be a discussion about rental assistance. And honestly, my my resolution addresses rental assistance, but um, we also have a, a, a separate one that talks about mortgage assistance as well, because those of us who are homeowners, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much money you make. If you've lost your job, if your income has gone down, whether you're paying rent or paying mortgage, That's right. you're, you're in a you're in a pickle here. So um, we are hoping to have as Congress uh, it talks about the next stimulus package, which is happening now. Um, you know, the House actually has already passed um, their version of one. Right, right. But as they talk about this fourth stimulus package, making sure that we can address that and then address the needs. I mean, the concerns that some of them have. And I'll, I'll just put it out there. I mean, some of the concerns that, you know, some more conservative members of Congress and all elected bodies have had is, well, you know, well, we gave twelve hundred dollars. Well, Hello, twelve hundred dollars is not a lot of money. <laughs> when you not. got rent, you got to feed people, and and what I share with everybody as as a working mom, we're home, kids are home, so you you, you know yeah, they eating girl. <laughs> eating. They they got lights on if uh, yes. computers on. I mean, so your electricity bill's gone up, your food bill's gone up, and so that twelve hundred dollars doesn't go very far. Um, but some of the concern was like, well, if they had twelve hundred dollars, you know, rent should be you know place to stay is the most important. That should go to that. Um, And so some of the concerns were, well, if we give people more money, which hopefully there will be another stimulus package that gets money into the hands of, you know, the folk, the the citizens. But Mm -hmm. some of the concerns I heard or some of the feedback I heard um, was if we put money, if we give more money, how do we know it's going to go to rent? And so our resolution just addresses it as rental assistance. And that it will, like SC Thrive, it'll go directly to the more uh, the, the, the landlord, so that you know that's paid, and then they can hopefully use the twelve hundred or whatever else may come additionally for the other living expenses. And so, um, so anyway, so that the resolution was just one avenue I went. I'm so glad that SC Thrive and SC um, and South Carolina State Housing has um, released their program. Like I mentioned, I I spoke to. Um, uh, Benita Shopshire, the executive director at State Housing, maybe about four weeks ago about the same thing. And what she talked about was they had this money, they had $5 million and they were working out the logistics. So um, so at least, and that is statewide, which is good because I, I wasn't, you know, of course I'm advocating for my citizens here in yeah, Columbia. Yeah. This is a national problem. It's a state it problem. It is. It is. So hopefully this $5 million will help. Um, but if we go on our history from 2008, 2009, it will just be a drop in a bucket. So we're going to continue. Our resolution has been passed. It oh, has gone. To, it has gone to Congress and the city of Columbia. We have lobbyists, um, DC lobbyists, who work on our priorities. And so our DC lobbyists know that this is a priority. Um, in addition to that resolution um, and and asking for some mortgage help as well, we also passed um, we passed a resolution this week that I introduced that is asking that. Um, that even Congress look at not putting all these restrictions and stuff on money, just give a direct allocation to local governments and then let us do it. Because let, if you see what you we know did, best. Yeah, you know best what your city needs. Yeah. yeah. When you see what we did, like with the small business loan, mm-hmm. I mean, we were the first people who actually gave money to small businesses, you know, over the PPP loan and all the stuff that Congress did because it was just too many bells and whistles and too many things to go to. So the city was able to to get that money out on the street, get it in the hands of business owners very quickly. So we have a track record of doing it. And so the stimulus, the third stimulus package that passed said that um, that money came directly to governmental entities, government governmental subdivisions of 500,000 people or more. Mm-hmm. Well, for South Carolina, that cuts out every city or county. That money went straight to the state um, and it's up is uh, Governor uh, McMaster's discretion on how that money is going to be used. We're still hopeful that the city of Columbia will get some money, but we're not. It's, it's not a foregone conclusion. Right. Um, even still from the state giving out money, it takes some time. So um, the last the past resolution we just passed is asking 
also for this um, last stimulus money to give a direct allocation to local governments based on our CDB allocation. So our community development block grant allocations. You know, Congress already every year gives local cities and counties monies based on the information we have in the census, mm -hmm. um, our, our demographics, everything else. And so there's already a formula in place. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. They just have to use that formula and say, we're going to give this $100 billion to local um, governments based on the CDBG formula. And then that money will come to us and give us the discretion to, to use it. So if we do get that, then we'll be able to use that for rental assistance, mortgage assistance, um, continuing feeding programs. Um, I'm also really concerned about education. You know, although we yeah. don't fund our schools, you know, you've got you. We already usually have the summer slide. Now, kids, will, by the time they go back to school, kids would have been out of school for almost half a year. That's right. That's right. If they go back. And yeah. however they go back. Yeah. Uh, I want to say um, hi to uh, Barbara Belton for uh, watching. Also, Arlene Wilson. Arlene says the way things are going right now, she cannot afford to pay $700 to $900 per month for mortgage plus other essentials. She's thinking about buying a home. Arlene, just hold on. Because you know what, Tamika, I think that after this is over or what, what I, don't, I don't know that it'll ever be over, but it may be an opportunity for Arlene to get a, a good buy on a house or something like that. But just hold on, Arlene. Home ownership is on the way for you. Also want to say hi to a Charles Smith who is watching from New York. That's my brother, Tamika. And, wow. to, a, <laughs> and to a Tony Pearson. Uh, who uh, who's with the Tony Pearson talk show. Thank you all for watching Coping with COVID and for everyone else in the replay. We're talking to uh, the first African-American female to serve on the Columbia, South Carolina City Council, Tamika Isaac Devine, attorney Tamika Isaac Devine. And uh, she made a boss move, everybody. She asked Congress for some money, honey, for her citizens. She wants rental assistance. And that just makes so much sense. Uh, Arlene Wilson says, amen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, and you were also saying, Tamika, that you were asking for some other funds to help the city. And I have to tell you, um, and Steve, uh, our mayor, Steve Benjamin, was on last week. And and I think the city has been so responsible with the uh, funding that they have received, that you guys have received, and really looked out for, like I said, for small businesses, for, for our citizens. And so I think we can be rest assured that whatever other funds that are allocated, you'll you'll continue to be responsible for them. Yeah, definitely. And so one thing just to correct, the thing is the uh, million and a half that we gave out to small businesses, that wasn't any money that we received from anybody else. That was actually city money. Uh, we yeah. went into our reserves. And so we are definitely putting our money where our mouth is. We're not asking the state or Congress to give us money um, you know, and just give it to us. We we did our do first. We we went to our first line of, of of resources. We went to our reserve, which is you know usually people call their rainy day fund. Yeah. Um, well, it we was raining and it was pouring down, right? It was pouring. It was <laughs> pouring. pouring. Yeah. So we yeah. did we did that, and so and 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 yes, it have been a great steward of money. I mean, we have allocated uh, one point five million dollars to small businesses, five hundred thousand to nonprofits. Um, they are, you know, two year forgivable loans. So if, you know, if the criteria is met, if they spend the money, they say um, the way they say they're going to, which I mean, clearly they will because there's so many needs out there in the community, yeah. that money will be forgivable. And that is a lifeline. I mean, you know it, I know it as small business owners. I mean, it's, it's tough. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, as a small business owner myself, I've applied for PPP. I've applied for the idle, the um, economic injury disaster loan. I've applied for the county has a, a program. So my small business, um, my law firm, we've applied for all those things. To date, I've not, we've not received anything yet. And so it's a struggle. I mean, yeah. and I'm in addition to running that business, I'm teaching my kids at home. And, right. and it's, you know, so it's a struggle. And if I did yeah. not, if I wasn't blessed to have, you know, another income, in, um, you know, I have another business, so I have another income plus my husband has income, you know, I wouldn't be able to make, make ends meet. Small businesses, that's where things are. But in addition to people, and, and there's been a lot of focus on small businesses where that's the need because there's, you know, small businesses run our country, really. Yes, but yes. in addition to small businesses, businesses need assistance, citizens need assistance. And so that's what these resolutions are about. 
give us the ability, like you said, I, we know where, where, where are the needs of our community are. I know that there are families out there that are struggling. I mean, when you talk about Harvest Hope Food Bank saying how much, you know, how many people who have never come to the food bank before, but are coming there. Mm-hmm. Um, when, you know, when I talk to, you know, uh, teachers and, and, and they're talking about the fact that they can't really connect with their students because their students don't have any access to broadband and stuff. So there, I mean, I've talked to teachers who've been crying, literally crying because they feel like their kids are, are losing so much during this time. And so if we can take the pressure off of these families, even just a little bit, it, it'll help. And so the second resolution is that it's just asking for direct allocation to city. So if they give us that direct allocation, then that covers the first resolution too, because we certainly will use that as a priority for mortgage assistance, rental assistance, that kind of stuff. But we want that money to come to the city. And so one thing I can tell your your listeners, and whether you you live in Columbia or not, this the resolution um, is a joint resolution that many cities. Um, are doing throughout the country um, and is being pushed by not just the National League of Cities, but the U.S. Conference of Mayors um, and a lot of other government entities. But what you can do is call your your uh, Congress people, call your representatives, call your senators and tell them that in this fourth stimulus package that Congress will be looking at, you would like to see a direct allocation to local governments because Mm -hmm. local governments is where the money will get to the people quicker and it you know it will really address the needs in your community what detroit needs is different from what city of columbia exactly so i don't need someone in congress kind of telling us how we should be able to use money they need to be able to give it to us and then trust that you know we will get it into the hands of the community that needs it Yeah, that's good stuff, Tamika, that, like you said, no matter where you live, you can be an advocate for the monies and the resources that come into your community. Like you said, reach out to your state legislators. These are people that were put in and and, and, uh, national legislators. These are people that you voted into office to represent you. And you say, no matter where you live, you can say, listen, make sure that that government money uh, goes to the specific cities, correct? Yes, that make sure that the local government gets a direct allocation. That's that's the word you want to use, the direct, yeah, direct allocation. allocation. And anybody, yeah. if you want to know, just reach out to me and I can give you a copy of the resolution or I can give you some talking points. But, you know, we really need our elected officials to hear from us because I do feel like, you know, you have some folks who are, especially in Washington, they they are disconnected from, you know, what is happening here on the ground and the hurt that a lot of folks have. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, and just over the, this time I've been, you know, it's just been amazing to me to see how, you know, there have been comments about, you know, well, people should make more on unemployment than they should, you know, in, in their regular jobs. You know, unemployment will end. Um, That's and, right. And if someone gets a hundred or so more dollars a week, they already will grossly underpaid probably right. anyway. they were already behind the eight ball in the first yeah. place <laughs> and and it's it's so interesting to me so even like yesterday you might have seen on my, my facebook page i posted um a, a graphic that yes. um, i've That's seen funny. several times and basically what it is is it's it's three people um looking trying to look over a fence at a baseball game and the first one um shows where they're all standing on a box that's the same height Mm-hmm. So the, the the height of the box is equal, equal, but the view that they all have is still unequal yeah. because of the different things that they have. And the second one is the the different size boxes, so they're still all being able to see. Um, but you know, because and that's equity, because you don't get, you can't address a, a problem with the same thing if people are starting from a different um, place. And then the third one, the fence is down. <laughs> because the barrier has been removed right. and, and it gives all of them equal access. Equal access. And yeah. that's what government is supposed to be. It is supposed to give everybody um the same fair access to a system and to, you know, and to say, well, you know, it and unemployment should only give you what you were getting before. Well, you, when you got people paying making three two and three jobs, barely making right. ends meet, right. even unemployment at what you were making before doesn't give you what you need to have to, to really thrive. Like you say on this show, yeah, to thrive during this, this yeah. period. But here's so what we're hoping me. is that get, get that passed and at least that acknowledgement that we need more resources. Absolutely. But here's the thing, when you are on unemployment, they don't give you exactly what you were making 
at the job you were at anyway, if it were not for the $600 a week stimulus, when you're on unemployment, and I've been on unemployment, so I know I'm not talking about something I heard. I'm just telling you something I know. They don't give you exactly what you were making every week. They give you a portion of it, a, a general, you know, it's a generalization of what you're getting. So, you know, I, I mean, yeah, I, I just, I, I agree with you. Those folks, again, if we're talking about people in the service industry who are working for tips, basically, you know, whatever they get, and, and I've heard people say that too, whatever they get, they need that and more to survive because they were just barely surviving in the first place. Uh, City Councilwoman Tamika Isaac Devine has uh, joined us on Coping with COVID. I want to thank everyone. Kimberly Hicks says, good afternoon, ladies. Uh, F. Maxine Moses has a question. I'm going to get to hers. But first, Tony Pearson says, is it true that the stimulus money has to be paid back? I'm not sure what stimulus money he's talking about. Do you, Tamika? So, yeah, he's talking about the $1,200. And um, so, Tony, oh. that, is a oh. great, that is a great question. And I have asked the question, I'll be honest with you, um, even the answer I've gotten varies. <laughs> but what I, what I do, un, what I understand is that that $1,200 um, will be reported as income. Mm -hmm. um, and so as you file your taxes for 2020, uh, that will be included in your income. And therefore, if you are in a position that you you know, that offsets your tax refund next year, or it is money that, you know, will be, you have to pay, pay money on, basically pay it back or pay taxes on it. That may be the situation. Now, again, I, I, I caution, I say, I clarify that um, by saying I have asked like three or four different people and I've gotten three or four different. Right. Yeah. So I, that is my understanding at this point. But I also understand that a lot of this is very fluid, that it, 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 it depends. Next year is a different year. I mean, yeah. it'll be after an election year. You may have a Congress next year. You may have a president next year. You may have, you know, other people in positions that may say this isn't the way. So I think that's why I'm getting different answers, because I think it's very fluid. Um, even like with the PPP loans, you may have heard the reason that the rollout was so bad is because, you um, Treasury didn't even give the banks the guidance until the night of it about to come out. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, and then they've changed PPP from the first time to the second time. So again, all of this is fluid. Um, so that's also something that, you know, you need to make sure that your elected officials um, understand. I mean, I have done, I've tried my best to share with all of our representatives, like I said, from the House, from House members, senators, and and like you, you mentioned, you know, they whether you vote for them or not, they represent you. That's right. And so they need to hear from you. But I try to share real life stories, like you just said about unemployment. It ain't something I, I've been told. It's something I know. Right. I'm just trying to say, look, these are real people. This isn't a story that you got right. from this person, right. whatever. This is a real person. This is a real person who lives in your district, and this is how they're struggling through this. Um, through this epidemic. Um, and so I've tried to share that. But I think if they hear from you and say, you know, look, you know, this was no fault of, of our own. Right. You know, right. I was I was unemployed. I had to do it. So right. I didn't bring it you know, over here from China. Yeah. <laughs> you know? This money was something that was needed. And yeah. it, it should be something that our government owes us in order to keep, you know, keep our country running, keep our keep citizens safe. Yeah. Exactly. Hey, Tony, thank you so much for the question. I would also say to Tony, just to stay in touch with your tax professional, whoever, you know, does your taxes, just keep in touch with them, Tony, so that you'll know exactly what's going on. Um, and how uh, you can minimize it. So if it is something that's going to be reported as income, you want to make sure when you're filing your taxes, yeah, your tax preparer will tell you before the end of the year, make sure you do this, make sure you do that exactly. so that you can offset whatever that that effect may be, if any. Right. Maxine Moses has a question and we talked about this earlier. Uh, she wants to know uh, about the SC housing. Is it different from what the city of Columbia is offering? You mentioned that earlier on, but if you want to repeat, you know, please do. So Maxine, we don't have anything in place yet. So what I was talking about was the resolution that I got, that I proposed and, and unanimously passed among my colleagues. Um, but over this, I've been going through a lot of different things. So I've talked to State housing. So state housing and I had talked already. So if we do get this money from Congress and we do a program, it will be 
if not exactly the same at what state housing is doing, it'll be very similar. Um, and but it would only be for city of Columbia residents. Right. But you know, but they, it's different. But it's different. Right. It's sure. different. So, yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't I, what I would tell people is don't hold your breath that the city will get money <laughs> to do it. So right now it's open. Go ahead and apply for state housing. Um, because that is up and going and that $5 million will go by quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you think $5 million sounds like a lot of money, but if, you know, if the, everybody's been out of work. That's right. So there are a lot of people who will need that, that assistance. And so go ahead and apply for that. And if the city is, is blessed enough to be able to implement a program that's similar, then um, I, there shouldn't be any prohi prohibitions for someone applying for this one as well. We may give priority to people who did not get assistance somewhere else. But, you know, just like with the Congress, people already got the twelve hundred dollars. You're talking about giving another because we know the longer this thing lasts, even though things are opening back up, the economy is still very sluggish. So it, it's going to be a while before people, uh, quote, get back to normal. Yeah. And um, for anyone who is wondering what Maxine is talking about, and we talked about it early on in the show, SC Thrive and SC Housing have collaborated for this uh, $5 million that uh, Tamika talked about. And they're giving uh, those folks $1,500. It's a one-time forgivable payment. It's, it's up to. It's up to, yeah, up to mm -hmm. $1,500 that'll go yeah. directly to your landlord and um, you won't have to pay it back. It's a, it's a, it's a grant, and but you do have to uh, live in South Carolina and you have to qualify. So go to SC Thrive backslash COVID-19 rental assistance program, SC Thrive backslash COVID-19 rental assistance program. And uh, you those uh applications opened up yesterday. Folks mm -hmm. can apply for that money right now. And as Tamika said, you might be able to get up to $1,500 that will be some direct, directly sent to your landlord. Now, this is for anyone in South Carolina. Well, yes, but you also though, for this, you have to show that your problem with your rent is directly related to COVID. Right, right, so right. you when have you to, your you job, were, whatever. Yeah, so if you were unemployed before COVID happened, um, then you may not be eligible, you know, so just put that preface and that, that caveat in there. Cause I know even like with, um, with unemployment and other things, I know that there were some people who had applied for unemployment who had lost jobs before, um, things started closing. And so they were denied, they still could have gotten unemployment had they applied correctly, but they were denied. And I had people calling like, I, everybody's getting unemployment. And then they realized that, you well, your unemployment was a straight unemployment. It you didn't qualify for what Congress gave. So right. this one for um for state housing, it has you have to show that you've been affected by COVID. And the way you show that is that you, you know, you were unemployed for a period of time. You had a decrease, you might have been employed, but you had they cut your hours, so you had a decrease in income. Um, even if you show that, you know, I, I think you can really sh be challenged if you show you've had an increase in expenses. Like we talked about, you know, people are having to do different things and their expenses are increasing in some areas because now you're home all the time. Right. Your electricity, your food bill, you know, things of that sort. Nikki Simmons says, hello from Myrtle Beach. Hey, thank you, Nikki, so much for watching Coping with COVID. Charles Smith has a question, Tamika. He wants to know, <laughs> why is it we can never get any kind of help from our government without having to paying most or all of it back? That's the million dollar question. <laughs> So yeah, I, I wish I could answer that. I mean, I guess what I would say generally based on the conversation of in rooms I'm in a lot, um, I think it basically is taxpayer money and elected officials, rightfully so, feel very uh, strong that it is, it is this is the public's money. And so we have to be very um, prudent the way we use it and making sure it's used for essential things. Um, and so you know, part of that is, you know, making sure that the government continues to run. You got to pay the government staff. You got to pay the government bills, that kind of stuff. So things like this, which are looked at is I look at it as a return on our taxpayer money because right. we do pay taxes. Right. And That's so, what I was going to say. I'm yeah. a taxpayer. This is my money, you know, yeah. so to speak. So I look at it like that. Um, but I, I think a lot, some folks, um, you know, and it's, it's ideology. Some people look at it as, you know, government handouts you're asking for a handout from the government. You're asking for free money. You're asking for something that you don't deserve. I mean, and, and so that's just real talk. What, you know, some people, that's just their thoughts. And I'm not sure you can convince them differently. <laughs> we just need to make sure that you got 
um, you have a diversity of opinions around the table. And in order to get people who have a broader view at the table, we got to vote. I mean, I, the, you know, you, Trey, Trey, you and I talk about that all the time, but it just frustrates me the number of people who do not participate in the process right. and, or they get mad or they get on Facebook and want to fuss about <laughs> different things, but they don't go and get engaged in the system. Right. They're you know, not voting. Right. You know, vote for people. And then once people are then, you don't hold them accountable. Um, and then if they're not doing what they need to do, you don't come out and vote, you know, vote them out. And so we need people who are in office who will understand you know, again, the where we are from and, and what's happening and why this is money that needs to come back to support the community. Because, you know, and I tell people I, I was on a radio, I was on Don Fryer's yesterday and he and I were talking and the question came up about how, you know, is this an economic issue or is this public health issue? Mm -hmm. And I have that debate with somebody almost every day and it's frustrating. Both are very important, but for the way I look at it, if we address the public health parts of it, economics is going to work itself out. I mean, exactly. just if the government will, I mean, the, the economy will work itself out. If we have healthy people who are able to work, are out there working, the economy will get back. But, you know, but if people are dying or having, you know, huge issues because of this um, crisis, then they're not able to help our economy go. So we need to be focused on the public health part. And if we do, then everything else will work itself out. Absolutely. I agree. And I think it's hand in hand. You know, I think, yeah, is it is it um, an economic situation or is it the public health? It, it's 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 hand in hand, you know, because if you are in an economic crunch, if you're in an economic downfall, if you are not doing well economically, it's going to directly affect your access to public health or your access to the things you need to be healthy and stay healthy and things of that sort. So, you know, it, it's, it's just kind of hand in hand. And, and, and I agree with you. If we just, if all things were fair and equitable, you know, if everyone could get a decent wage, decent health care, as you said, the, the, the uh, graphic that you put up yesterday, you know, everybody's not, you know, has doesn't have level playing field. It's not a level playing field. You know, you can say it's equal opportunity for everybody. You can say that all day and all night, but it's really not. Mm -hmm. It's really not. So. You know, and 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 true, there are some people that are just either what take advantage of the system. They take the system for granted and don't um, access some things that are available. But then there's that demographic of people who are just trying and trying and trying and just trying and just it's just set up. They're just not set up to win. Yeah. You know, and it is really unfortunate. Hey, thank you, Chuck uh, Charles Smith, <laughs> for uh, <laughs> for um, for uh, for your question. Maxine says she thinks the website crashed. You can't get on. Well, they announced it yesterday, Max. So I do not okay. doubt that you can't get on. Let me give you a phone number though too: eight hundred seven two six eight seven seven four. That's eight hundred seven two six eight seven seven four is the number for SC Thrive. If uh, maybe you can get through to. Um, to the uh, phone number. I actually have a um, email I've been emailing the folks over at SC Thrive. We're going to talk about them getting on in the next couple of days so they can kind of really talk about the process. City Councilwoman Tamika Isaac Devon is with us from the city of Columbia. Uh, you're watching Coping with COVID. I'm Trey Taylor. And we've been talking about the city's uh, efforts to get emergency rental assistance for city of Columbia residents that were affected by COVID. Uh, you're doing a uh, uh, anything else as far as that's concerned to me, because I want to I, I really, you know, kind of really want to talk about what else the city of Columbia is doing to really help folks get through this process before we go to the next topic. So that's the only other thing that's kind of immediate. Um, well, I, what I would say is that, you know, this continues to be um, a, a passion of mine, um, even outside of COVID. We have we have people who are struggling financially. Um, and so as part of my leadership in National League of Cities, you know, I've been chair of our um, council, on Econ um, council on Youth Education and Families, which, you know, a big part of that is financial independence and uh, uh, financial economic mobility for, for citizens. So I've gained a lot of information on that. And ultimately, you know, I would love for the city to have a very robust um, economic mobility department, I call it family financial stability department that some other cities have. Um, but, you know, what I would say for that is the, the pieces of that have already been put into place. 
And so even outside of COVID, the Community Development Department of the City of Columbia, we do have um, what we call our, uh, our bank on program, which is one piece of that fi financial family stability, which will help you if you don't have a banking relationship, which is something that people talked about. Like that's one of the, the glitches that some people had with PPP. You have small businesses, but there are a lot of small businesses that are like sole proprietors and hey, it's Tamika and I'm doing the work. So <laughs> right. money comes to me and I don't have a business account that goes in my account. And so when it was for me to apply for this, I didn't have the documentation. And so anyway, uh, so the Office of Business Opportunities is helping with those kind of programs to help right. with businesses. But the Community Development Department is working with individuals. And so Bank On will help you establish a banking relationship with our partner banks. We're partnering with Optus Bank and um, oh, I always forget the name of it. <laughs> South Carolina Bank and Trust, Nate's Bank. What? I don't know. Right. The name of it. I can't remember. State Barbara's <laughs> Bank. South, South State Bank. South State. Right. Bank. South State. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So South State and Optus are our partner banks, and so uh, whether you've had a bank account before and you had some glitches and they closed it, and you know you feel like, oh, I just whatever. It's it's like it, it is an opportunity to develop a banking relationship so that you have someone to go to. So that's the Bank On program. We also have um, our IDA program, which is our individual uh, development account programs, which basically is like a savings account. We will help you save money to start a business, go to college, buy a house, um, those kind of things. So that's part of that. And then the third part that we've already established is our child savings account programs. It's still That's still in the pilot stage. Um, so we're only working with Watkins, Nance, and gosh, I can't forget, two elementary schools, two <laughs> Title I elementary schools right now. But what we are doing is we are encouraging, we're starting with the uh, with uh, five-year-olds in kindergarten. Oh, we start wow. a savings account for them. We help them save money and teach them about money. So those are three components that we currently have. And eventually, I'd love to expand this to talk about you know, wealth building, especially in the minority community. Yes, um, yes. And so we'll be we'll be doing more programs, hopefully. I think for the immediate future, they'll be virtual, unfortunately. But we will be doing more programs um, to help people understand, you know, this. You know, people say that COVID-19, I, I heard um, someone say, Don Lemon say this, and I keep repeating it because I think it's so true. So people call uh, coronavirus uh, the great equalizer because no matter your age, race, financial condition, it hits everybody. Mm -hmm. But it's also the great magnifier because what it has done, it has mag Wanda, yeah. yes, come yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wanda Thank does you, the Wanda. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, but it's also the great magnifier because it, it has magnified issues yes. that have already yes. existed in our community. Yes. But it, it we knew it, but maybe not everybody else knew it. From health disparities to financial instability, um access to health care, you know, all that stuff. And so what I am hoping th is that if we can kind of keep the passion that everybody has right now in addressing and, and fighting together this, this pandemic, we also will keep that passion to fight these issues that have been magnified in our community because of this pandemic. And so I'm hoping Wanda helps me with my programs and stuff too. I'm really hoping, hey, John Lakin, um, <laughs> I'm hey, hoping John that um, we will continue that. So I just ask people to continue to kind of watch what, you know, I put out there and post. Um, I'm going to have a great conversation next week, um, kind of starting this series. I'm going to have a great conversation next week with um, a guy from Prosperity Now, and they do a lot of the national um, work on uh, the, the racial wealth gap mm -hmm. and why minority communities have so little wealth compared to other populations. And I think it, it, I think it's, it's telling when you think about how systemically these have been issues in our community for many, many years. Yeah. And if we don't address it, uh, start addressing it now, it'll be, you know, 100 years before we actually are, quote, equal. Yeah, well, that's why. And we want to say hi to John Lake and hi to Wanda Austin. Thank you so much for joining us on Coping with COVID. And anybody watching in the replay, thank you so much. We appreciate you uh, joining us. Please like and share this great information out. Tamika has dropped some great gems. We've talked about some uh, important um, resources for folks in and around, not only in our community, in our state and in our nation. So uh, we definitely want uh, to get the message out to the masses. But, you know, it, it's kind of like, um, what's the... Um, my, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It's kind of like that book where um, 
it's we are going to continue to have generations of inequity because if your parents don't know how to save, if they don't know how to whatever, you know, they can't teach the the, the child how to do that. So um, these types of programs that really focus on the child and then maybe help the parent out is are so important because as you say, I mean, we see it. We see generations of people in public housing or generations of people utilizing um, uh, you know, SNAP or, you know, those types of programs or or even with the, with the health inequities, the high blood pressure, the, the diabetes, things of that mm -hmm. sort. But if we can educate, one, our young people and educate our older people, you know, their parents, um, but it's got to start somewhere. It's got to start somewhere. And it definitely has everything to do. And I truly believe this. Those of us who know better, you know, it's, you know, sometimes you get frustrated talking to people and you feel like, oh, they're not listening. They, they don't, you know, but it's it's up to those who know to help those who don't know. That's mm. just that's that's just the responsibility. You know, look, it's in the words of Kermit the Frog. It's not easy being green. <laughs> But, but you also, want to green out here. You need to go ahead and you know spread. But also, sorry, we can't. You know, but we also can't assume that people know. I mean, I think oh, that's oh, also, you're right. That's also sometimes, um, like you know, sometimes I, I'll and like I say, I continue to go to these. Like Wanda could tell you, I'll, I'll come back for yeah. poor city staff. I come back all full of ideas, <laughs> and they because <laughs> I'm a part time council person, they're um, charged with implementing them. But, um, you know, I continue to learn because that that makes me a good Absolutely. public official. Yeah. Um, I, I know what's happening in my community, but I also need to learn what other people are doing, but then yeah. hear from experts. And one of the things I, I say is interesting is like sometimes we assume that people know stuff. Yeah. But they may not know it or they might not really understand it the way it's affecting more folks. And so oh, I think you're right. I think it's, and I, I didn't say that to be critical. I'm just saying that like what you said before, like I, we, it is, we all have a responsibility. We do. We, we don't need to get frustrated when we feel like, well, I'm just talking and they don't get mm -hmm. it. They may not, they, we might assume that they're coming at it from a different standpoint than they really are. And so our job is really to make sure that we continue to make that information available, which is why it's so critical that, you know, you are doing this show because I mean, you've been doing this, what, about five, six weeks now? Five, six weeks, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, just the information that you're helping get out there. There are so many people who don't pick up, you know, you're uh, don't pick up the, the paper. You're right. I, I don't read the paper, but, <laughs> I the news, but I watch the news. But there are right. people who don't watch the news. Where they get their information is from talks like this. And so yeah. we have to continue to elevate those conversations and not assume that people know stuff because the more we talk about it, I mean, like what I've learned about the wealth gap, I thought I knew a whole lot. I have learned so much really within the last two years with, you know, with the work I did with Elizabeth Warren and what I'm mm -hmm. learning from prosperity now, because there, and I, I'm just now reading a book. I actually bought it for all my, my colleagues on city council. So hopefully they will all read it, but it's called the color of law. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm going to post it probably tomorrow. Um, but anyway, but it, it is about how, uh, how this country, what this government, this country has done to people over the years, mm -hmm. how it has helped um, segregate the company, uh, country, how country. it has keep people down. And so it's like, it's even reading that, like um, Will Brennan um, and one of my colleagues, you know, he mentioned to me, he was like, thank you so much. He was like, I was just reading like the first chapter and I had no idea dot, 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 dot. Mm -hmm. And so that's just elevating. We can't assume that people know stuff because, you know, there are a lot of things, even our young people just don't know because it's yeah. not out all the time. Oh, I definitely uh, agree with you. Yeah. Uh, Wanda says she loves when you bring ideas back. You know, listen, I, I want to say something about what you said, but I want to say something about what Wanda said, too. You are creative and I get it. And and when you are you're being a creative, it's, it's so um, important and helpful that you do have city staff like Wanda and, and Leisha and whomever else who appreciate you coming back with a million ideas, you know, and not being. Uh, or being open to saying, well, let's try it. You know, let's just see how it's going to happen. And you have done some, you know, amazing, the, the let's move and, you know, all of the things that you've done you. it ha have have been just instrumental, you know, for the city to the city. So it makes a difference when you as a creative and you're a creative can um, go back and people get 
what you're saying and not say, oh, that's too much or I don't, I don't know how to implement that. That those are the things that matter. And and that's what it really what I'm in when I say and, and I, you know, those who know and I'm not saying and I know you said you didn't say this, but you and you're right. You can't assume people know because, listen, there's some things I have no idea about. And people may think that. <laughs> I know, look, because I know what I know, and that's all I know, <laughs> you know. But whatever I do know, it is my responsibility to then share that with other people. You, you know what I'm saying? I, I, you know, and 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 to be patient and kind and loving and godlike when sharing that information. Why? Because somebody else doesn't know what I know. You know what I mean? We, we, the, the Lord has blessed us with all different gifts and talents and strengths and weaknesses. And, uh, but if we do know, if we do have that, um, that level of understanding or knowledge, whatever it is, it is our responsibility, which, like I said, I, I wanted to do this show. I wanted, it was just so much information to make. It was so much information that needed to be shared. And I know that there's people who don't even girl, if it don't come on BET, they, it, they you know, I used to tell my son that sometime the world. Real housewives. Yeah. Girl, stop. <laughs> you know, <laughs> fake news, you know, but, you know, and I used to tell my son when he was a teenager, even a young 20 year old, you know, the, the world, if the world is going to go to hell in a hell, a hell in a, in a handbasket and you won't know what's going on because you're not watching the news. So listen, you got to bring the information to where people are. You got to give it to them where they are. And to your point, and then I try to give it the least common denominator. I mean, that's something we learned at Hampton in journalism school <laughs> that you give people and you talk to people like from the standpoint of they know nothing so that you can get the person who knows everything and the person who, who may not have as much knowledge about a situation, you know, just make it simple, you know, just keeping it simple. Tamika Isaac Devine is joining us with her beautiful, I look, I told you her before we got um, on the air, I said, her and Jennifer Bishop with this COVID hair, I can't take it. <laughs> and all this beautiful COVID hair going on. <laughs> John, uh, so I go to John T. Elliott. He opened back up this week and he called. He said, well, I know you got your braids, but I'm open back up. I said, I love you, John. And I know you're going to be sanitizing the stuff, but I'm waiting. I said, I got my hair. I'm I'm, <laughs> stay, I'm still staying. I mean, my my kids, do it. They, I know they're so tired, but I don't I don't let them. I rode around with the baby yesterday just to get them out the house. I don't let them go anywhere. <laughs> so, yeah, but thank you. I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I love the braids. I supported one of our young students by getting my hair done. She's a cosmetic. She's actually graduating this year from a uh, Richland One um, in cosmetology. So, yeah. shout out. Shout out to Kira. Yeah, and uh, um, uh, Sherry at um, Haywood Career Center, because you made me think maybe I'll call Sherry too and get me some braids or something, but I'm so attached to my head, right, girl? I anyway. Love Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm just, I, I love my head wrap and I'm doing my hair under it. I'm it's just not raggedy under there. I'm doing my hair under it. Tamika Isaac Devon is joining us on COVID with COVID with the, with the, with the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about a um, webinar that she's doing. You mentioned the, um, the public, the, uh, the inequity uh, webinar that you're doing. Uh, tell us when that is. And then we'll talk about the other one you're doing about uh, networking. Okay, so next Tuesday um, at one o'clock, I'm going to be inter interviewing uh, Dietrich Asante um, with, uh, gosh, what do I call it? The Prosperity, <laughs> Prosperity, Prosperity Now. Uh, yeah. yeah, so and it'll be, it'll live on my Facebook page and on my YouTube page. So anybody can watch the replay as well. But that'll be next Tuesday and I'll, I'll post the details about that. They can see that. Okay. Um, and then this weekend, Sunday night, I'm actually doing a webinar. Um, on uh, networking in the age of coronavirus. And, and I sh share with you offline, the reason that I started doing this, you know, at my other business, I do coaching and consulting and speaking. And I was working with one of my coaching clients and I was doing her check-in and and she, I was like, where how have you done with your networking, et cetera? We have a networking plan for her. She was like, well, I hadn't done anything because you know, you can't go anywhere, everything's closed. And I explained, I said, no, COVID is not a reason not to be networking. I said, actually, you know, and I know networking is hard for a lot of folks, but um, this is really one of the best times to be networking because a lot of folks that you might not be able to get access to before, they're not going out either. And so their busyness has kind of tamped down. So you could probably get them on the phone 
or you can network with them or their home more. So they're reading their emails more. And so I'm going to share some tips and strategies about how even when things do open up like they are now, but we're not having events, how do you network um, effectively during this time and beyond to make sure you're still moving forward with your goals? Yeah, that's good. And that's Sunday night. What time, Tamika? That's Sunday night at seven. Um, and it is, you can go to my Facebook page um, for the registration information. So Tamika Isaac Devine, and it's up there. The reg, it's the, well, it's on both, but the, the one with the blue dress, I always tell you, but the one with the blue dress <laughs> is that where you'll see um, the link uh, to register. I've got, I think, um, yeah, we're, I'm going to max out probably at a hundred where we're about 50 people now. So, but, so go ahead and register. That's good. Um, That's and it should be really, really interesting. Um, and I want to definitely just share, cause I know folks are like, Oh, Tamika, you know, Trey, you and I talked about this about networking yes. like, oh, it's so easy for you guys. You know, it's, it's not necessarily easy for us, but it works because you and I are intentional about the relationships right. that we build. Right. Um, and it's not about just for, what this person can do for me, but what I have to offer them. And mm -hmm. so I think what makes someone a good networker is the intentionality you bring to what you're trying to do so that you have, you've created those expectations about what, you know, what benefit you want to see out of it. So we're going to talk yeah. about networking in general, but specifically about how do you network in this time of coronavirus, either utilizing emails or social media or calling people and how are you strategic about doing it so that you can continue to move things forward, even though you can't meet somebody for coffee like you might have would used to. Yeah, exactly. And you need to make those. I think it's even more important now than ever because we don't have that face to face as much that you really utilize not only your social media, but, um, you know, keeping up with people, like you said, that you that you meet, that you used to know, you know, are you keeping those? And, and you know, it's it is intentional. It mm -hmm. is intentional. It's not easy. Who, who are you talking? Who's who just walked by Jamie? <laughs> my, my husband is giving I, me my, my ballot. I have a, um, I was like, as, again, I'm not going out anywhere. So I've, I've called for those of you, June 9th is the primary. Right. We talked about the importance of elections. We talked to, we it, talked to Matt Kissner yesterday with Richard County Democratic Party. Yeah. Good. So he's telling me my ballot came because I was talking about it this morning that I need to get my ballot. So I, I saw the shadow in. go by. <laughs> I said, that must be Jamie. <laughs> hi, Jamie. He says, hi. <laughs> He says, what's up? Uh -oh. <laughs> so, uh, Tamika, if people want more information about you, about um, the city, if, if they have some questions, um, and I know you'll be updating us on um, your initiative to help get some rental assistance or any of the other things that you're doing, how can people get in touch with you? Sure. I'm on all social media. So Facebook, Tamika Isaac Devine. Um, Instagram and LinkedIn, all those three of those, Tamika Isaac Divine on Twitter, I'm T.I. Divine. Um, and then also my website is adivinelife.com. Um, or you can always go to the city of Columbia's website. And if you click under city council members, it has a direct link where you can email me. So any of those, I am not hard to find. Just Google me. <laughs> <laughs> or like like a Nikita B says, I'm Googleable. Googleable, so. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so you can get me anytime, but usually, you know, if you if you email me, I can get back to you within a couple hours. All right. Regina Henderson Moore is watching. I want to thank you so much for watching Coping with COVID. This is Tamika Isaac Devine. Uh, please continue to post and share this information so we can get this important message out to the masses. I'm Trey Taylor. As always, as we leave, I share today's Jesus Calling. <clears throat> and today, May 21st says, I am the creator of the universe and I am here for you. What more could you need? When you feel some lack, it's because you're not connecting with me on a deep level. I offer abundant life. Your part is to trust me, refusing to worry about anything. Oh, this is good. It's not so much adverse events that make you anxious as it is your thoughts about those events. Your mind engages in efforts to take control of the situation, to bring about the result you desire. Your thoughts close in on the problem like ravenous wolves, determined to make things go your way. You forget that I'm in charge of your life. The only remedy is to switch your focus from the problem to my presence. Stop all your striving and watch and see what I will do because I am the Lord.
That's good stuff right there. <laughs> That's Jesus Calling for May 21st. If you want more information about Jesus Calling, they actually have a website. You can go to JesusCalling.com and order your Jesus Calling. Again, please post and share this great information so we can get it out. Like and follow me also on Facebook and Instagram at Trey Taylor or Taylor Made Productions. And you can go to the YouTube channel to view all of the past and current and future coping with COVID. Now, if you have a COVID related message or product or service that you could think would be of help to some folks, please inbox me um, on Facebook at Trey Taylor or email the Taylor Made Productions at gmail.com. We can talk about how you can be part of coping with COVID. Tomorrow, we've got a big show, Tamika. We're going to talk about how church will change post COVID. Yeah. Pastor John P. Key with New Life Fellowship in Charlotte, he's going to join us. Travis Green with um, Forward City Church is going to join us. Also, Chris Levy Johnson, who I, I, I've got to, I've got to uh, blast him out. He just sent me a text saying, um, I'm a singer. Why is my picture not as big as John and Travis? <laughs> he made me laugh out loud. And then he said, um, Oh, I'm just kidding. He said the way I sing, my picture should be on the back of the flyer. But anyway, <laughs> Chris Levy Johnson is going to be here with uh, Brooklyn Baptist Church uh, Northeast and two other pastors, um, uh, Damone P. Johnson from Metropolitan Church in Albany, New York, is also going to be on Coping with COVID. That's tomorrow at two o'clock. On Saturday, we're going to talk to Dr. Nicole Edwards. We're going to talk about um, some of the new uh, symptoms for COVID, also some of these symptoms and uh, diagnosis that are affecting our young people, and also talk about some of these new remedies that our president has mentioned that he's taking. We're going to talk about that and see if that might be something that you should or should not try. Also coming up next week, we're going to talk to some patients who have experienced and survived COVID-19. All that and more coming up next week on Coping with COVID. I'm Trey Taylor. Thank you again so much for joining us. Tamika, thank you as always for uh, you. joining us. I appreciate you. Beautiful. Jewel Harrison says hello to both of us. You guys stay safe, stay careful, and remain blessed. Have a great day. <laughs>